Hello, Mr. Palmer. Welcome to this episode of Today on Wall Street. So great to have you here with us today. So, uh, Mr. Palmer, you are the de deputy editor of Foreign Policy, a celebrated journalist, and um, many of my colleagues and myself included are readers of China Brief, which is this weekly digest of the most important stories on China during that week. And thank you so much for delivering such valuable information to us. But in addition to being a journalist, you're also a avid Twitter user. So yeah, so it was actually one of your recent tweets that caught my attention. This is this hilarious breakdown of the likely contest behind uh, one, of the, one of the posts tweeted out by the Chinese embassy in Ireland, which completely butchered uh, the Aesop's fable on wolf and lamb. Over the last few years, have you noticed a growing presence of Chinese diplomats and their increasing aggressive behavior? Yes, we've seen Chinese diplomats take to Twitter more and more. Almost every embassy or even consulate now has a Twitter presence. Um, that really started with uh, Zhao Lijian in um, Pakistan, or Muhammad Zhao Lijian, as he was calling himself then, before he, uh, bef before he decided that w wasn't a great idea back home. And he, he really pioneered this sort of style of aggressive Twitter presence, um, including the sort of insults against uh, insults against dissidents, insults against any government that criticized China and so on. And it was his promotion to be the spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that really very clearly signaled that Beijing sort of approved this language from the top, that this just wasn't just a, a sort of one-off thing. It was the new trend, the new standard for Chinese diplomats uh, on Western social media. You know, um, Chinese state media has had a uh, social media presence for a long time, including buying a lot of followers. Um, so People's Daily is very big on Facebook, for instance. But it built up that audience by almost entirely anodyne content. A lot of uh, videos of, you know, um, like cute animals and 10 most beautiful women in X province and all this kind of thing. So a lot of very dull, sort of banal content that just accumulated over time, um, mixed with a bunch of uh, purchases of, of users and so on. And that's created a sort of base, uh, a sort of foundation for this new aggressive style to work off. Gotcha, gotcha. I guess, I mean, to me, the, the most perplexing thing is who the actual target audience is. I mean, the majority of Chinese don't even have access to Twitter. And, you know, if they have access to Twitter, English Twitter is not their primary source of information. And, you know, the, the kind of aggressive rhetoric by people like Zhao Lijian certainly doesn't play well with the international audience. So what's the purpose of that kind of, you know, aggressive tweeting behavior is, I mean, I, I joke with my colleagues, it, it almost seems like there's this like tacit understanding that the more eyeballs you can grab on Twitter, the more engagement you can get, there might be like a scoreboard somewhere back in the, uh, in the ministry, right, where you can get more points, and that will help with your promotion. So, I mean, more seriously, what's actually the incentive or promotion structure? Well, you're, 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 you're actually not 100% uh, off talking about the, the scoreboard. You know, when I worked for Global Times, um, there was a, a literal posting of how many mentions in foreign media articles had gotten. Now, this was, you know, pre the sort of interest in social media. So it was just old fashioned media. But there was no distinguishing between good coverage of a story and bad coverage of a story. So uh, a Global Times editorial by Hu Shijin that said, you know, it's time to nuke Australia, um, which, you know, would get like hundreds and hundreds of, of newspaper articles about it um, in the West or in India or whatever would be um, valued more than a, a well-researched, you know, sane article that maybe one or two people retweeted for, um, covered in the West for business reasons, like an article on, you know, say that the, uh, the, the growth of the Chinese fur industry and its problems or something like that, a, a normal newspaper article. Gotcha. And so, and so, I wouldn't be surprised because you know you have to remember the mainland is a very quota-oriented place. That the legacy of that sort of Taylorist, Stalinist system, or where everything has to be measured, everything has to be counted, is still there. And so, I really would not be surprised if the if the the retweets and quote tweets and so on and likes were being fed back into the system for information. Um, now. 
what complicates that, of course, is that all um, within Chinese domestic media, um, every level of Chinese government now operates a whole level of fake users, bots, um, paid PR services, and so on. Um, that's also beginning to be the case on Western social media. We see these large bot networks to support them, these very low count users, or sometimes these old accounts that have been sold and taken over um, for new purposes. And they, they're the ones that are responding to these comments. So it's a sort of self-congratulatory system. Um, but then on top of that, it's just the display of sort of vehemence is always aimed at their bosses, aimed at showing I'm following the party line, I'm following what we're supposed to be doing at the moment. And a little bit of it too is aimed at Chinese domestic media because what these account holders will sometimes do, particularly um, not so much the ambassadors that I've seen, though with some exceptions, but very much some of the state media employees, they will take their responses in, on Western Twitter and screenshot them for domestic Chinese Twitter to try and build up that Weibo or you know Weishu, to try and uh, build up their following there. So it's basic. So they use the sort of um, argumentative style, the the nastiness, to show um, to show to people back home how 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 you know how clever they're being. It's a little bit like when you know like Ben Shapiro or another conservative uh, on Twitter posts something. And he knows it's going to be torn apart by, uh, you know, a million, like, non-stupid users, but it's being able to display it to the stupid users that matters for him. Gotcha, gotcha. So interesting. And speaking of the people behind those Twitter accounts, I know you have interacted with Chinese diplomats. So do you mind telling us a little bit about sort of uh, the typical background of a Chinese diplomat? Um, what's your education like? What's your language proficiency? And what's the selection process within the hierarchy? And I guess the question is, how does someone ghastly on diplomatic like the young from real, um, you know, who called uh, Justin mm -hmm. Trudeau the running dog of the United States ends up being consul general. So who are these people and what are, what are they like? Well, um, so compared to most countries, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is relatively low powered in China. So, you know, in, in the US, like state is sec really second only to treasury, maybe equal to treasury in power. In the United Kingdom, the Home Office and the Foreign Office are really the, the two, you know, great organs of state. But in China, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is like eighth, ninth, maybe, in terms of relative power. So it's it's not as big a deal. And the smartest people generally don't go into the diplomatic service. The smartest people have generally gone to things like the you know National Development and Reform Commission, um, these domestically focused like um, central government organs with a lot of uh, a lot of power. So traditionally, to get into the foreign service, you went to the um, foreign affairs university in Be uh, foreign studies university in Beijing. Um, you did a, a BA there. Uh, sometimes, if you sometimes you're trained up from very early for a specific language. So this is something that actually the service does very well. Is whereas um, the United States really struggles to find you know, say, um, uh, speakers of, of small African languages. The Chinese system picks out people from early on and says, you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to learn like the three languages of Rwanda. You're going to learn like two Congolese languages, something like this. Um, and so in these smaller countries, they actually have often very good people compared to their counterparts because they have people who have really trained for this since they were 18. Um, but these people are generally not the people who are going to rise to the highest levels because they're the they're the kind of smart kids, you know, the country kids who don't have a lot of guanxi and who, so who can't get onto the English track, say, or, or the French track or even the Japanese track, where it's much more competitive and you're much more likely to come from a family with power. And in, in recent years, sometimes even the requirement for the initial BA in China has been skipped and you've had people coming in at sort of 20... 24, 25, um, who've done time in foreign universities because of um, their uh, their families or because they were not bright enough to pass the Gaokao and so they, they got, you know, um, shift off to some third-rate Canadian university. So 
Um, you also have some people now being parachuted in from other parts of the party system, like uh, former mayors um, who kind of built up a political reputation of um, being given these posts as, re as rewards who really have very little training or experience in, in diplomatic service. Um, so, so particularly on the English track, I think you have a lot of people who aren't necessarily super, super brilliant, but who have, you know, a reasonable amount of influence, reasonable amount of pull, and so are able to take these plum positions, particularly in, in, you know, countries that are nice to live in. Like in every, you know, in every diplomatic service, there's a clear division between hardship posts and comfort posts, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So in most places, you know, in the, in the US, in the State Department, for instance, you do a year in say, the, in say Lahore, which is a very unpleasant posting, um, to be in order to then get your pick of posts that you do afterwards. But in, in the Chinese system, it tends to much more be about like who your family is, what connections you have with your, who your mentor is. This is a little bit the case in every system, but it's particularly the case in the Chinese system. I see, I see. So the, the people within the system, you know, by and large are not the cream of the top, so to speak. But, um, you know, looking just looking at the kind of media image, the you know, the Chinese uh, propaganda machine present to us, I have to say, it's pretty clumsy. I mean, so China has this grand strategy of promoting soft power, promoting its image abroad. But in general, like if you look at the stuff they put out, it's pretty clear to me that they're not successful. I mean, if you, even if I have no prior knowledge of what's going on in Xinjiang, if I just look at chock full of ads of Uyghurs singing and dancing and praising the party, and if you if you tell me that's proof of the absence of gen genocide, and that's not convincing at all. So why is China so bad at, at doing this? Couldn't they be a little better and hire some smart people to, to I mean, since they're already wasting so time I think it's, it? I think it's worse on the issues where the politics are most acute. So the thing with Xinjiang, of course, is that nobody can deviate even a little bit from the party line at the moment. So you can't say, for instance, oh, Uyghur people you know, suffer from racism in China, but the Chinese state is working against that racism. It's a, you can't you, you can't give even the kind of little bit of ground that you would need to create a convincing lie. Um, it has to, um, as the issue becomes more fraught, the lie has to be more dramatic because it's more about proving you're, again, sticking to the line back home than it is actually trying to convince anyone. But I think if you look at issues that are less tense, China's often been quite successful at selling its own image. So think about things like, say, infrastructure. Um, it's this idea of China's like this enormous infrastructure power. Now, China certainly ha has do had done some amazing things with infrastructure, but the way the way it's been picked up by Western media and, re and become this package of like, oh, China can build things super quickly without talking about, you know, any of the collapses or human costs um, that we've seen as a result of this, that's a successful form of propaganda in itself. So this easy packaging. It's also very, very successful at reaching out to businesses. Um, it's become a little bit worse at this again because on Xinjiang, because the the blatantness of it has brought it into the open. Um, but, you know, five years ago, there would have been much quieter pressure on companies like H&M. And we're still seeing Western companies that want the Chinese market being used as uh, levers by Beijing to try and um, push particular agendas in the United States. Boeing, for instance, came out the other day and said, oh, you know, we don't want, you know, we want to separate human rights issues and, and trade issues. And that will be because of, you know, years and years and years of their Chinese counterparts um, or Chinese officials and wings working with them on selling particular images. And we see time and again that in particular, the dumber kind of pro-business politician is incredibly susceptible to Chinese propaganda messaging when taken to on, on you know, a week-long trip and meeting all these like young people who have such wonderful things to say and who are so, and who don't, who aren't interested in democracy. And, you know, the, it was explained to me that the system is meritocratic. And, you know, a lot of Westerners really eat this stuff up and regurgitate it back into the sort of think tank sphere or the, um, or, or the behind the scenes Kind of networking in in uh, in DC or in London.
I see. I see. So interesting. So um, next question, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk a little bit about sort of the structure of Chinese state media outlets. I mean, there are many of them. Um, the one that I find really interesting is Global Times, you know, outlet for which you also worked briefly. Mm -hmm. So oh, not that briefly. I worked, I worked there for seven years. Oh, my goodness. That's uh, yes. quite a I had other jobs, career. but it was my I, I, I wrote two books in that time uh, and, and a lot of articles for other media. But that was my visa. And my uh, and my steady income for a long time. Gotcha. So we can't wait. Uh, so you know, technically, Global Times is this, this, this like it's published by People's Daily, which is this you know Paramount CCP mouthpiece, but it sure goes beyond that. So so I mean, what's the deal with the Global Times? Who are the audience? And pick one person, Hu Xijin. Should we take him seriously when he says something on Twitter? What do you make of those belligerent uh, Global Times editorials based on your experience so working for it? So four years ago, I would have said, don't take Hu Shijin seriously on Twitter. I think the situation has changed. So originally when, originally when English language Global Times was founded, it was this weird hybrid of genuine desire to do you know, a, a more kind of liberal, more interesting version of uh, China Daily. Um, the one that did sort of actual in-depth reporting and controversial interviews and so on, which for the first sort of two or three years was was more or less the case. There was a mixture of, you know, maybe 20% of the content was genuinely interesting and envelope pushing, 20% of it was mad, and 60% of it was just banal or boring. Um, and, you know, I, I think even Hu Shijin had some desire to push that envelope. He was actually always quite good about things like freedom of speech for journalists back in those days, quite supportive of other Chinese media in the days when it seemed as though that was possible, when it seemed as though there was a gradual movement towards a more open kind of sphere of public expression in the PRC. Now, of course, that ended very, you know, pretty sharply uh, in 2012, 2013. And the Global Times um, and Who started to move more towards the sort of um, uh, like constantly nationalistic, propagandistic and so on. Who's own editorials had always been along those lines, but they were somewhat aimed at building up the uh, domestic readership of Huan Chu Shibao, the original Chinese version, which always was much more popular in, you know, was the financial underpinnings of the English language version. Though the English language version had more staff, it was only financially possible because it got a tax break um, as a res from the government in order to run it. The, it allowed the whole thing to, 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 be, to be more or less profitable. So when, but, you know, four or five years ago, I would have said there's, there's a, Hu Shijin is one end of a range of possible opinion within the PRC. And he is the extreme end of the, of the nationalistic spectrum. He doesn't even necessarily represent where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is. And um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who don't hold his views. He's mostly trolling for attention from foreign media or trying to build up his, his like domestic readership. But I think that's changed. I think that now, firstly, we're seeing that space has really narrowed um, as, and who has become much more representative of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, much closer to the way that the diplomats themselves operate. Uh, and we've seen, you know, ideas such as um, lawsuits, um, counter sanctions and so on run through Global Times before coming out of the official kind of um, mouthpieces being being implemented properly a few days or weeks later. So Global Times has gone from being an outlier to being a sort of forerunner of what the rest of the system will do. And it's, it's that requires taking it much more seriously than we did a few years ago. I see, I see. So, you know, after we chatted about China's media strategy, I also wanted to touch upon China's media technology. Um, as you know, China has vast capability of censorship powered by AI. Sometimes they can, you know, wipe out unfavorable content using things like keyword picking or, you know, image matching and stuff like that. And, you know, increasingly we see China has been able to use uh, bot networks, you know, 50 cent army, whatever, to flush the, the, the space of discussion with you know, basically pro-party materials. So do you worry that those um, those technologies can be portable, they can be exported to um, other authoritarian regimes and be this global network of misinformation? And if that's the case, should the United States and other Western countries be alarmed by that possibility? And 
how should we counter China in this war of information or war of disinformation, so to speak? So I would say that the, the big difference between China and other countries is that no other country has the scale of China that allows for the development of an entirely separate um, like internet ecosystem. So all those kind of AI techniques work because the Chinese internet is cut off from the rest of the world's internet because web oil is a different thing from Twitter and so on. They only really, they only really work on scale if you control the, if you control the companies themselves. Um, so, and so since most of the world uses these firms that their own governments don't have direct control over, I think that's much less of a risk. Now, botnets and so on, we've already seen them being deployed on a big scale by, by Russia, by other bad operators. Um, they're not, they're, they're not actually a huge problem. Most of it is wasted money. Most of it kind of just washes up against the, the, sh the sort of shores and the, the, um, uh, the big, you know, the big U.S. firms have become much sharper at identifying and taking out the like those networks of bad actors at, at this point. And I think we'll see something of a sort of arms race in, you know, the sort of um, uh, spam tech, basically as we did with literal spam, but sort of you know, the, in the the botnet technology versus like um, the uh, platforms, um, because it's not in the thing is fundamentally it's not in most social media's interests to allow these kinds of things to spread. Now, I'd say the exception is Facebook, because Facebook has a record of directly profiting off um, taking money from uh, foreign governments and uh, other bad actors. But Facebook is under enormous political pressure in the United States for those practices to cease. And I think, you know, where that goes will be a, a sign, you know, is Facebook willing to take money to promote, you know, images of all singing, all dancing Uyghur, for instance. Um, and there have been discussions within the company, but um, they've done nothing about it. And I don't think they will do anything about it until um, the US government like starts squeezing them, basically. I see, I see. So since we were talking about misinformation and propaganda, final question is actually, um, right-wing media on, you know, among Western mm -hmm. countries. Um, as you probably know, many, pro-democracy Chinese dissidents and activists actually bought into many of the right-wing media stuff, especially during this last election mm -hmm. cycle. How did it happen? Yeah, I, so I think that there are several factors. Firstly, you know, um, a large portion of the diaspora has always been quite Christian. And in the US, that's tended to mean association with uh, right-wing politicians. So you see people who I think are, you know, um, good faith actors, are, are sincere dissidents like Bob Fu say, um, who nevertheless are, are right-wing Christians and so adopt the politics of right-wing Christians in the United States, which are, which are very Trumpist. So that's one factor. I think also you get this odd thing where, and you see this with Russians too, people bought up in totalitarian systems um, tend to be very susceptible to believing in conspiracies because in China, so much of life operates... Uh, along the lines of not very well concealed right. conspiracies. It's uh, whether, uh, you know, local, provincial, whatever. And so they buy into these kind of, these ideas, this, these ideas that like there are these secret forces um, working like against you, working against the, the, the sort of ordinary citizen chapter. Um, and then I think the Democrats did not do well in the, the sort of, um, China human rights rights space in the in the two thousands in the two thousands in particular, and so Republicans came to dominate a lot of that space. The people who were most pushing human rights issues um, were people like Marco Rubio. Um, so you know, if say you're uh, a lot of um, a lot of you know Uyghur activists, I know, for instance, have been very grateful to to Marco Rubio, and because they don't have a great sense of U.S. politics, they're coming into this as outsiders. Then naturally, they identify with his. With you know that side, that that sort of um, team, because they see these people, um, they see these uh, conservative senators taking positions on, on behalf of Hong Kong, on behalf of Uyghur and so on. I think that's changing because you're getting much more bipartisan kind of effort on it. You're getting um, you know people like AOC speaking out on these issues as well. But certainly for um, people for people who came to the U.S. in the 2000s uh, or the 
2010s that this is this played a, a major role in identifying with the Republican Party. I see. I see. Well, thank you so much for all the insights, such a helpful conversation. And um, we will make sure to include a link to your foreign policy column at the uh, show notes section so our readers and audience can take a look at your other work. Thank you so much, Mr. Palmer. It's been a great, great pleasure talking to thank you. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Bye.